fire burn. And what was Mario talking about? Something about insurance agent and inspecting the houses to see whether it started arson or trying to collect insurance or that? Oh, yeah. Well, this story is going to be a little bit different from that. <laughs> We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, and I'm kind of cutting out a few of the verses, trying to shorten a little bit. We're going to look 1 to 2, 4 to 6, and 8 to 12, because some of it's uh, repetitive. Anybody here want to name their child Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, Nebi or something? <laughs> anyway, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, which is 90 feet, 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, magistrates and all the other provisional officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Let us pray, Lord. We are thankful for this word this morning. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. May it cut through the very marble of our world. Lord, open our ears, our hearts, to receive your truth that you have for us today. And help me, Lord, be your messenger in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever given in to someone even though you knew it was wrong? <laughs> I remember in high school, I did some things I'm not proud of. But you get together with some of your other friends, and you go out and do some things that you probably wouldn't do otherwise. Because you're going along with what other people are doing. And it seems kind of fun at the time. You know, after all, boys will be boys, right? But I look back now, and I'm certainly not proud of some of the things I did. And I even knew that when I did them, they were wrong. I can't speak ignorance. I can't you know, say, well, or that I was naive or didn't know. I knew what I was doing. If you ever come back and then done those things, but then you justified it in your own mind so you could live with yourself. You know, I talk about, um, we have one small business. We've only a couple small businesses. And it really opened my eyes as we started meeting other small business people. Because every single one of them had somebody steal from them. Employee, a manager, their bookkeeper, you know, in all different ways. My wife worked in a dentist office where the manager was overcharging people and keeping some of the money. So how do people do it? Well, the doctor makes too much anyway. I deserve to have them. You know, we find ways to justify it. Even though really, we know it's wrong. We know stealing is wrong, right? But yet, we still do it. But then there are times maybe where you did take a stand. Or maybe right now you're taking a stand. And sometimes when you take a stand in the workplace, 
it can be difficult because you may end up losing your job as a result. And so when do you take the stand and when do you not take the stand? Well, in Babylon, they worshiped idols. It, it's so interesting. I, I, I just, for all of you, I'd love you to have the opportunity to travel to Thailand, to Vietnam, to Taiwan, to, to some of the Philippines, to some of the, these places where they literally still are worshiping idols. <coughs> In Taiwan, there was, you know, we saw this little shop with a, where a guy was in there carving with, out of wood idols. And they had idols of all shapes, all sizes. They have them for your house, they have them for the temple, they have them for everywhere. What is it about idols that we are drawn to? I have my own theory. So this is, remember, this is a theory. Okay? So it doesn't mean it's true. I was an insurance agent for seven, eight years. You know the hardest product to sell? Life insurance. Mm -hmm. Why? Everybody thinks they're going to die someday, but not today, or not tomorrow. Everybody thinks they have more time. Okay. I thought. I think part of the problem with the insurance product, especially with something like life insurance, is you can't touch it, you can't feel it. You know. And I think for people, they just feel like their money's going down the drain. And then I sold cars. Well, people can get emotional over cars. They can touch it. They can feel it. They can drive it. They can look at it. And it just, it seemed easy almost selling cars after selling something like life insurance. Because it's something people can get excited about. Something they can see for themselves. And I almost think that maybe idols are the same way, you know. When Moses is up on the mountain, they make the idol of the cat. You know, they want, it's like they, they were so desperate, they wanted something to worship. Something to see. And that's, what, and uh, Mario alluded to it a little bit when he was talking earlier, you know, about atheists that are agnostics. You know, prove to me God exists. I want to see him. I want to touch him. If he exists, where is he? I don't see him. Well, look all around. Look at his creation. How can you deny a God? Study the human body, the anatomy of the human body. How could that, all those things intricately that work together, how could that just happen? Oh, evolution. Really? Really? I, I believe that evolution takes much stronger faith than the belief in God, the creator, that there's actually a creator, an organized divine plan of creation. Idols worship. Nebuchadnezzar image. This image is big. Really big. 90 feet. Gold from head to toe. Sometimes just the heads were gold. This thing was gold head to toe. He figured this would help unite the nation and solidify its power. Nations today you know, let's look North Korea, which technically there is no country. Do you know there's no country technically called North Korea? <laughs> this is side one. I served in South Korea, so that's where it came from. It's, North is not even supposed to be capitalized because it's Korea. It was never official. There is no separate country-wise North Korea and South Korea. It's Democratic Republic of Korea is North Korea. Isn't the funny Democratic Republic and that's North Korea. But anyway, but you look at these dictators and, and you, you can see them you know, around the world. How do they unify their country? To get them all unified against a foreign enemy. Yeah, fear. Talk about how bad the United States is. And how well, they want to destroy us, and they are out to get us, and all this and that. And you brainwash the people, and think, and they, you pull, unify, you solidify them, and pull them together. 
against this common enemy. When I was served in the military, Soviet Union. I mean, it was clear that was our enemy, and it was a real threat. And you unify the troops against this common enemy, even the country unified, knowing that Soviet Union was our enemy. Yeah, like I said, the statue is gold headed toe. This statue is 300 feet. This statue of Buddha, and I don't know if you notice the insignia that's on his chest. Does that look similar? Yeah, that's where Nazis got it from. It was well before Nazis ever took power, this symbol in Buddhism. This was in the city that we lived in, Kaohsiung, Korea, uh, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, I'm sorry. 300 feet. They had all around the island these huge idols, these huge statues to worship. Moving on in Daniel chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. It says, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? I'm like, Tell me this is not true. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, or all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down, and zither is a strong string instrument, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, all is good. But, if you don't worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, which is God's will, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So let's hear They're willing to die for their faith. They're willing to die for their faith. Now, this is not just a little small furnace like you have in your house. This thing was huge, okay? It was enormous. It was an industrial furnace used to melt down gold. So think about maybe something at the steel mill. Flames were leaping from the top out of it. The fiery blast was so strong that it killed the soldiers that were taking them down there to put them in. They couldn't even get close to it. That's the reason for the high temps that they had in these furnaces to be able to liquefy gold so all the impurities would be gone. Heat purifies. Fire purifies. Right? First Peter 1 7, I'm sorry. The New Living Translation said, These trials will show that your faith is genuine, it's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So in these furnaces that look at fire and gold, they knew it was done when they looked into it, they could see their own reflection. They knew the gold had been purified. You know Jesus looks for reflection in us. The gold of our faith. As it's purified through the trials that we go through. What? You haven't been through any trials? <laughs> Give it time. Uh, come put some anointing on me if you haven't been through. <laughs> 25% of people surveyed believe the sun is a planet. The sun is not a planet. 2% actually believe the income taxes that are paid are too low. 1% read the Bible more than once a day. But here's one thing 100% of all believers agree on. They've all been through a difficult time. 
they've all had a real trial in their lives. You may be going through something right now. Maybe you're experiencing a real difficult time right now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they experienced kind of a hot time. Not only was the furnace blazing, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered that it would be seven times hotter than normal. He wanted to make sure there was absolutely no chance of them surviving. Because they wouldn't bow to his statue. But they said, God's going to deliver us. Either he's going to rescue us from the furnace, or we're going to die and see him in heaven. Either way, we're going to be delivered. Either way. Right? There's three things I'd like to talk about right now when it comes to the trial. <coughs> the time of the trial, the peace in the trial, and the fellowship we have by going through the trial. The time. If we look at what's happening to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're going through this trial, they're not in the midst of sin. Are they? They're in the midst of worshiping God. They're not in undergoing anything that you would think would invite Satan to come in and tempt them, right? The trial came when they were standing strong, but yet they could have made excuses. They? they could have said, well, we're bowing to this idol, but really we're bowing to the Lord. In our heart, we're really bowing to the Lord, even though, okay, when they play the music, we get down on our hands and knees and bow. Justification, right? Anybody been there? Anybody do any justification? This isn't a big deal. Right? So we bow to the idol. We can still live for the Lord. After all, if we remain in leadership, we can impact more people for the Lord. Then if we're removed, if we're removed, then who's going to stand? Have you, have you ever been there? Have you ever done any of this rationalization? <clears throat> Trials come often when we're doing well. Not necessarily when we're not doing well. And this is Satan. Yeah. This isn't the Lord. The Lord's not telling you he's angry with you. He's mad at you for what you did. Satan getting in the ring. Why? Because he is a liar. He's a liar. Tell him you the Lord is angry with you. That comes from the pit of hell. God's challenging us during this trial to grow, to mature, to develop our character, to be stronger in our faith. Not because God's angry with us. In John chapter 15, verse 2, Jesus says, He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. John 15, 1 says, God is the gardener. I am the vine. Yep. And we are grafted in Thank you, Lord. as part of the vine. Just as this is done on fruit trees, they have to be trimmed so they produce more fruit. Oftentimes we've got to be pruned a little. The sharp edges have to be trimmed off a little bit so that we can produce 
not always fun. It's not always easy. But this is God's way of forming us and shaping us into his character. So peace in the trial. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were in the furnace, they didn't look for a way out. In fact, when they put in the furnace, they were bound as well. They had their clothes on and they were bound. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar's not taking any chances here. Okay? They're not going to escape. They're going in. But they didn't try to take off the clothes. They didn't try to take off ropes or however they were tied. They didn't try to put out the fire. I don't know how they would throw your clothes on it or whatever. You know, but you're in that situation. You, you panic. You're going to do anything. Try, you know, you're going to try to put out the fire, right? They didn't. They didn't sit in the corner crying or pouting. Or, Why is this happening to me? They didn't complain. They didn't complain. How much hotter of a trial can you be in and then a blazing furnace? Never complain. What about for us? When we're in that fiery furnace or a trial or that hot time, was our first response try to control it? Right? <clears throat> Maybe try and put it out. But what happens if we do? It just pops up somewhere else, doesn't it? You know, God gives us opportunities. Sometimes to deal with something in our life that maybe we don't want to deal with. And so we run from that. What happens? It pops up somewhere else. Because God's given us another opportunity to deal with it. And if we never deal with it, it just keeps popping. It doesn't go away. These are opportunities. That's how we got to see these trials are opportunities to grow. Grow our faith, our character. <clears throat> Sometimes in these trials, you got to let it burn. You just got to let it burn. I'm sorry. Let the fire burn. Daniel 3.25 said, look, I see... Nebuchadnezzar says, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Hey, walk around. Is this as high as you can make this thing? Really? They don't feel a thing. They don't feel a thing. They didn't try and put it out. They didn't try and control it. They are wild God. To work. They allowed God to take control. Jesus, oh, I'm going to talk. Jesus said, "What? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Even if they would have died in that furnace, God was still with them." This, I think, is the most important thing we got to remember through trials. That we're not alone, we're not on our own, that God is with us. He will not abandon you, He will not forsake you, He will walk with you, He will lead you, He will guide you. Amen. And He'll reveal that light at the end of the tunnel, that, that light of hope that we may not have before. He's with us. He's for us. He's our advocate. I love that word advocate. That means he's fighting for you. He's your advocate. He's fighting for you. And some of the times that we know his presence the most is in those difficult times. Not when we're cruising, but maybe when we're cooking. <coughs> Here's what we talked about this morning. We see him. We know his presence. But those unbelievers are watching us as well. How are they going to deal with this crisis? How are they going to deal with this difficult situation? 
oh look, they did the same thing I do. They just complain and cry and groan about it. Or do they say, how come they have hope? They have hope? Where did that come from? How come they're not miserable? How come they're not downtrodden? How come, where's this hope come from? I don't have hope. One of the most powerful times of witness is others to see you going through a difficult time and how you're dealing with it. <clears throat> I just write Shadrach plus now because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stayed in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar ordered them out. They stayed there until he said, get out of there. <laughs> Jesus went through the fire also. <laughs> By going to the cross and chill with us. Jesus went through the fire for you. Amen. Went through the fire for me. He did that for you. To shield us from the fires of hell. He gave us the positive, what we say? The Holy Spirit. Anybody know that name? Dr. Donald Barnhouse. What a name, huh? He, he was a, a pretty well-known theologian, born in 1895, died in 1960. He was like a pioneer on radio shows for evangelical messages and so forth and did some writing. He was known for making God's word plain to people. But he tells a story of when he was a little child. And he lived on a farm. In a storm, like we're seeing going through the south, and uh, right now, a uh, big thunderstorm struck the tree, big oak tree, in their backyard that was near the barn, caught it on fire. And so they were concerned about all their farm animals that were in the barn. So they went out and rescued and got all the farm animals that they knew could get up, got them out. And sure enough, the fire jumped from the tree and burned down. Well, the next day, as a child, he's walking among the ashes and so forth, and he kicks over this clump of ash and finds these little chicks that survive. And so he's wondering, how could that have possibly happened? Well, they, dis they discovered that their mother, the hen, had covered them and sacrificed her own life to save those little chicks. That was her way of saving them, was covering them, protecting them from the fire and saving them that way. In Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would gather you under my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't let me. But you wouldn't let me. If there's anybody here this morning that has rejected God and not allowed Him to gather you under His wings, now's the time <coughs> to repent. Now's the time to seek God. Because His desire is for everyone to come to know Him. His desire is to spread His wings over every one of us to protect us. To nurture us. I mean, that breaks my heart when I when I read that last part. But you wouldn't let me. You wouldn't let me. I wanted to protect you. I wanted to walk with you through the trial. I wanted to be there. But you rejected me. You wouldn't let me. That's called free will. We have the choice. We have the choice. Word went to the cross and died for us to insulate us from the fires of judgment. The fires of judgment. He did not die to insulate you from the fires of trials. Those are still going to come. Yeah. But he's going to be there for you when you need him. Yeah. 
Now's the time of invitation. If anybody needs prayer, you're welcome to come forward. If you'd like to pray, Carrie, I'd be happy to pray with you in the back. I'm happy to pray with you up front. Or if you'd like to approach either one of us after church or Mario, any one of us would be happy to pray with you. <coughs> if there's something that this has stirred up inside of you, uh, I just I ask you to seek God. Seek God what it is. If there's something that you need to seek forgiveness for, ask God. He's waiting. He's just waiting. It's us to turn our back on Him. He does not turn His back on us. If you're going through a difficult time right now, seek God. You don't have to go through the wall. Satan wants you to believe that you do. That you're all by yourself. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares for you. Nobody wants you. God's angry with you. You know, if you hear those voices, you know what you can do? You can ask God. God, is this the truth? Amen. Is this the truth? If it does not line up with God's will, it does not line up with God's character, and I'll tell you, it's not God's truth. Because God does not see you that way. God loves you just the way you are. He, he sees the rough edges, and sure, He wants to smooth some of those rough edges, and that's part of what trials are designed to do. But He still loves you. No matter what you've done, No matter what you may think of yourself. And God can change that image too. Because we can find our identity. As we start in the book of Ephesians this morning, two of the main things in the book of Ephesians is God's power and our identity in Christ. That's what we find. Not by our job. Not by what we do. Not by who we know. Not whether we're famous or not. But we find our identity and how he sees us. So as you are going through the storms <coughs> of life, those are the times we should be praising God the most. We should be seeking God. We should be praising him. That he's given us the opportunity to grow. When we're in the midst of a storm, the hard thing is changing our focus. Because what we're looking at is right here. But I'm challenging now to change your focus to a vertical focus. To looking, when you're in the midst of the devil, looking to God. Knowing that He is with you through this difficult time. And you don't have to do it alone anymore. Praise God that He cares and loves us. Yes. yes. I'd like us to read Psalm 9, verses 1 to 10 together. Because, you know, hopefully you don't think this is an exercise in futility as we do this. But I think it's important as God's body together, sometimes reading scripture back to God as well, because it is his word and there's power in his word. So Psalm 9 verses 1 to 10 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my right and my cause. Sitting enthroned as the righteous judge, you have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. 
He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Let us pray, Lord. Let us all remember that you are our stronghold in times of trouble. That we can trust in you. That you will vanquish our enemies. And that you will stand with us as we move forward. And so, Lord, thank you for this promise. And thank you for the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's remain standing as we close.